Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre, with your host, Lonnie Scott. And we are recording. Once again, back is the incredible Mortellus. <laughs> uh, as I say to all my friends, I'm pretty regular, but I appreciate you rounding up. <laughs> regular <laughs> what <laughs> if i were asked to choose a word that describe you my friend regular is not going to be one of them <laughs> that excite, like most of my life is haunting my couch watching netflix and eating wheat thin probably i'm obsessed with wheat thins lately i eat those things all the time. there's probably some strange origin to the person that invented wheat thins right no there is <laughs> There no, always is. There's not. Actually, I was, I was thinking of Triscuits, but... <laughs> you know the story about Triscuits? We talked about the um, guy who invented... Graham crackers. Graham yep. crackers. Is it the same guy? It's not the same guy. It's but... not the same guy. What's the story with Triscuits? Well, there's a meme that goes around. It's like the existence of Triscuits <laughs> uh, suggests like a monoskit and a duoskit, right? Like you've got the... <laughs> <laughs> there's it's the three biscuit or whatever but they're, oh, actually, yeah. they're actually called triscuits because they advertise themselves as being the first uh like snack made with electricity like having electricity was still kind of new when they were invented so they were the electricity biscuit that's why they're triscuits. oh gotcha you look yeah. so proud of yourself <laughs> I, proud of I love shit like that <laughs> i know you do <laughs> okay um so we have discovered the thing about Triscuits. Uh, for the people who don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> that was all that was it. That was all that uh, Would you still describe yourself as a mortician, a witch, a necromancer, <laughs> a medium? Yes. No all those things. Facts about snack foods. <laughs> <laughs> a priest ex of a gardenarian coven. Correct. Yes. Yes, that's the down and dirty title, all right? I like that whole priest X thing. It is. It is. It's fun to say. Um, I'll, I'll I'll drop you like an exclusive detail. Oh <laughs> shit! <laughs> Back in the day when I was like, I don't know, but I don't think I'm a girl. Mm, questions, questions. Mm -hmm. Thinking about it. Thinking about it. Nope. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't want to use the title priestess, and it just wasn't vibing with me, and I was trying to decide what I was going to do and what was right for me, and um, I settled on priestess because I stumbled upon a Judas Priest cover band that is all female-fronted, and they're called <laughs> Judas Priestess, and I was like, but yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, breaking the bra, breaking the bra. <laughs> I read them like a dorky fan email one day and I was like, I know you're like a small band from who knows where, but you inspired me, thanks. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to have to look them up. <laughs> Everybody's going to go bomb their website. It'll be good. Yeah, all of a sudden they're selling albums again. Nobody knows why. <laughs> Do it. It's all just because that, you're fans. <laughs> that would be fucking awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna have to give you a link now so you can put it in the show notes. <laughs> yes, please do <laughs> send it to me on Messenger. Um I guess since the last time we've talked uh publicly <laughs> um have you had any kind of like haunting encounters or anything? Any eidolon of <laughs> any sort? When pop up in a memorable kind of way <laughs> when is that not my life i it's, know that's why i'm going for like anything that really stands out since the last time you're on okay. yeah it's been um, a couple years since you're on the show yeah okay stuff that stands out so um i'll be the weird woo woo person and i will say i i do experience full body apparitions that is a feature of my mediumship-esque abilities um 
my dear friend and coven student long since like graduated off into the world uh their father passed away in the time since since i was last on the show and uh their father's kind of a putz <laughs> so we came to an agreement that we were going to invite a uh, dear old dad to come hang out here so that they didn't go harass my friend and, and their family mm -hmm. and uh uh, the fun thing about this particular uh, incorporeal household member is uh, that he's a jackass, a complete jackass. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they vacillate between being like a beach bum and an extra from Miami Vice in how they look, which is very funny to me. But they seem to find it humorous to try and scare me like like crappy horror movie style. So they're always like, popping out like that ah, i get you this <laughs> it's like man if you do that again i'm gonna put you in a toaster <laughs> just <laughs> fuck off <laughs> so, that. that's um, gonna be the title of this episode <laughs> I'm <gonna> put you <laughs> <toaster>. <laughs> i'll put you in a toaster <laughs> <laughs> um, I did have kind of a fun experience um, at Con Carolina. It's a, a convention here in North Carolina in the Charlotte area, which I highly recommend. It's it's the weirdest vibe. It's like thirty percent paranormal convention and thirty percent like game stuff and thirty percent like uh, authors. So it's this weird sort of scattered out thing. But most everybody's pagan, and that's a fun vibe. But um, I got to speak there for the first time this year and uh, I'm just looking forward to going back. Had a real blast. And there was a paranormal investigator there and we happened to be walking in the same direction at the same time. And I was like, I will volunteer some random unsolicited information, but here's this uh, person I see with you and here's what they look like. And we're talking about it. And they're like, yeah, none of that is nothing. There is correct. All right. <laughs> I told you what I experienced. That's cool. Everything. <laughs> and you go home and you're like, I might be a fraud or possibly an idiot. You know, <laughs> yeah. but you have to trust your instincts. Right. So yeah. I got a message from them like four weeks after the event. And they were like, okay, so I, you know, traveled to see my, my aging mother or whatever. And when I get there, she rolls up out of the other room in the outfit that you described. And I asked where it came from and it belonged to her grandmother and she's like and then i told my mom about everything you said and and then i told her that this other thing that you said that she smelled like biscuits made no sense to me and that was stupid and dumb and the mom was <laughs> like oh actually she was a nutritionist at a school way back when and she made biscuits so much that there were jokes about it and they made they made a, a specialized biscuit press for them like it was a whole part of their life that uh the investigator didn't know about and uh, oh, they even cool. sent they even sent me a picture of the biscuit press so <laughs> it's always like nice. you know trusting your instincts and and like honoring what you're experiencing even when the other person isn't sure about the information it's mm -hmm. it's always fun when that comes back around i bet yeah, yeah. I, I mean i'm that way with tarot readings sometimes yeah. i feel like you, you get the person that just kind of stares at you yeah. They don't. They try to hide every possible facial expression and silence their body completely. Like I am not giving you anything. I'm like I'm not reading you, but every once in a while I'll say something and look up. Like, is this hitting home somehow? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, yeah. There, there's been times where I think I'm not. I'm not. This isn't going anywhere. And then all of a sudden, at the end of it, they'll be like, "I feel like you read my diary." <laughs> <laughs> This, this particular person was lovely and nice, but it was like, yeah, I don't know what any of that is that you said. <laughs> it yeah. Like, oh, it's cool. I'm just telling you myself. <laughs> yeah. So I did have, um, it was a tarot. I used to do tarot parties and stuff, you know, like get X amount of people for so much money and the host gets it for free, that kind of thing. Yeah. And a lot of people would book me for it. And then they'd bring over their friends, get wine bottles, start popping that, get it flowing. It's always a good time, right? Good vibe. And then COVID came along and ruined all that. But um, <clears throat> there was one party I was doing, and everybody's having a great time. The readings are going great. And I get to this one lady, and uh, I do the reading, and at the end of she's just staring at me the whole time, kind of one of them. 
And at the end of it, she goes, so that's it? And I said, yeah, that's it. And she goes, what are you, like a guidance counselor or something? <laughs> yes. And I was like, well, if you want to take it that way, <laughs> did you find it helpful? She goes, oh no. So I gave her her money back. I was just like, I would just rather you have your money and shut up and go away. <laughs> <laughs> You're not all going to be winners. Did, did I ever tell yeah. you about one time I did tarot reading for a party? No, do, no, you didn't. I do readings, but it's not a huge part of my life. I'm not out there beating the bushes with it. There are so many more talented people that do it that I, I feel like, you know, a fraud when I, when I go to it. <laughs> it's like, why would people hire me? I'm not, you know, I'm no fun. But um, no fun. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but I get, you know, I get a message one day about email and it's like, you know, we could use someone to read for a party. A thing you've never advertised. <laughs> would you do it for us? <laughs> And uh, I was like, are you sure you want me, like, you know, grumpy, goth, medium person, whatever, to show up and do, <laughs> and do tarot at a party? Is that the vibe you want? And they were like, yeah, we, we want you there. I should have asked more questions. <laughs> I think you're missing out on your business cards, grumpy, goth, medium person. <laughs> <laughs> just put that right in. Yeah. Um, I call that person. But, um... I show up and it's a fucking sweet 16 party. And I would like oh. to have known that before. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. So here I am. And I remember the first young person that sat down in my chair. And this has been years ago, but uh, they sit down and they're like, I want to know if I'm going to be an Olympic figure skater. And I thought to myself, <laughs> you have not started early enough in life to achieve that. First of all. <laughs> And they tripped on their way to the table. And I was thinking, this is not. Mm. <laughs> well, they, they had wanted me to do one card readings. It was a huge party. There were a lot of people. So I pulled, turn over a card and it's the fool. Ha ha ha. You never... <laughs> Funny stuff. I do the reading for the 16 year old. They go on their way. The next person comes up. I shuffled, you know, whatever. I pull out a card. It's the fool. Hmm. Every single person and they were all one card readings every person got that card that night what? No, matter, no matter how much i shuffled and no matter how improbable that sounds and it just felt like i was being tricked <laughs> no no it was your evil twin living inside you who said we know how to palm cards and we're gonna fuck with you <laughs> you know <laughs> Sorry, just take it out of the deck but <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, if you've got a room full of 16 year olds and they're like, give me advice about this question. I mean, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so since the last time we talked, there has been a change with your book <laughs> that's <Fair> been <laughs> upcoming for quite a while. <laughs> yes. Last time you were on the show, I was going on about, hey, it's. Go to Llewellyn, whatever, buy Llewellyn books and get it in September of 2021. Wah, wah, wah. I'm so, so excited. For a yeah. <laughs> yeah. So life happens. Things happen. There's no need to dig into that. That's that's True. neither here nor there. That's between you and, and your private business. Um, you did, however, uh, end up landing with Crossed Crow Books out of Chicago, Illinois. And I've really enjoyed their enthusiasm watching them grow and, and get excited about what they do. Um, and now, as of now, today, July 27th, 2023, you can pre-order that book. By the time people hear this and replay it and so on, it's probably going to be available. When is it actually, like, going to hit the shelves? October 3rd. <clears throat> October 3rd. Yes. All right. You heard it here twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, yeah. being being in relationships with publishers is not unlike a marriage. Sometimes people just aren't going to be a fit for each other, and you got that's right. You got a you got a hand part, you know. That's okay. It you happens. Go, you yeah. go on so, find your crunch place, and I will say I'm now happily in a relationship with Cross Crow, and they're they're super cool people. I, I truly, I really am, am enjoying working with them. It's it's funny you go from a a bigger publisher. Lou Ellen's not much bigger, but you know some and um. You maybe speak to one or two people and you don't know anybody there. And now I know everybody across the world. <laughs> every single person emails me every day and they ask me about even the smallest details with my book, which I just, I really love that they have an author centered approach to publishing where mm -hmm. 
every single author they work with is just really invested in every phase of their book's creation, which is amazing. I, re I just really love that. And uh, you, you've heard me talk before about, you know, don't judge a book by a cover by its cover because the author probably didn't get to choose it or the title either. But that's not really true with Cross Crow. Like, you know, that the author really had their, their fingers in every bit mm -hmm. of the pie, which is nice. Yes. And the book we're talking about is Bones Fall in a Spiral, a Necromantic Primer. Yeah. And I know for a fact, because I checked today, you can go to Cross Crow Books website and pre order that thing in paperback, hardcover, yes. and some special like goat skin something, I think. <laughs> So, so Cross Crow loves me and they're very sweet and kind to me. So <laughs> not only got a hardcover, which is a thing that is, you know, hard to achieve as a pagan author, right. uh, but they're doing a, a limited edition, an exclusive edition that is bound in goat skin. It's, it's all black. And I convinced them to go along with my wacky scheme to do like black foil on black matte leather. So it's this <laughs> beautiful beautiful thing with black end papers and it's it's very nice so yeah her part <laughs> hey what's your favorite color again <laughs> yeah, i you know i i get people that will make that joke to me and i do enjoy my monochrome but i always remind people that black is the presence of all colors <laughs> it's it is everything so to me black is a rainbow but that's oh, the artist there you go. so that's true um I guess we covered the publisher thing. I'm looking through my notes here about what I want to talk about with Cross Crow. I think we're pretty good to go. Um, back when we talked about your book the first time, I had a like a reviewer copy manuscript, and you may you mentioned more than once of me talking about certain things in it that I had an older version, and mm -hmm. changes have been made. Yes. Now have more changes been made? <laughs> Well, see, that's the thing about switching publishers, whereas maybe there were things in that first edition that I wanted to be in the book, but my editor or publisher didn't love and wound up getting, you know, wound up on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Not been the case with Cross Crow, so they, they trust me a lot, and there were some things I got to put back in from my original manuscript, so, so yes, it is a little different. There's some more stuff. Awesome. And, and if in oh. other super cool news, they are also printing an expanded edition of Do I Have to Wear Black, which you should hear some announcements about soon. So, Oh, that's yeah. very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're also making available signed copies. Yes. Of, on your website, correct? Yes. And right okay. now, I've, I don't have a ton up there, so if you want them, grab them. And uh, I, won't, I won't put more up after these sell out until I have you know until i have author copies and stuff so gotcha okay and that is mortellus.com it is indeed and it i is I, don't, indeed. I don't have the fancy leather version i'm not that cool I, <laughs> I have they should send you one <laughs> i i will get one yes yes you better <laughs> uh, yeah and but, i saw that um morgan daimler wrote the foreword for it yes yeah. how'd that come about how'd you and well, morgan hook up I love Morgan's pieces. I, you know, we we do that like ADHD neurodivergent thing where we're friends, but we never talk. We never talk. <laughs> Just forget you exist for like six months and then say hello about something weird like we've been talking since yesterday. But <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but uh, I reached out when I was first working on the book and was like, "Hey, awkwardly, would you would you like to do this?" <laughs> Because I feel like if there's anyone that understands the idea of something being misunderstood and stereotyped, it's Morgan. And in as much as necromancy is stereotyped and othered and really misunderstood, I think work with good folk is the same. And I thought they would really understand where I was coming from. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was, I love, it was a good I, match. I love Morgan. I think it's a great combination. Morgan has uh, been on the show a few times as well. And I can also consider Morgan a friend. And I also message Morgan every so often, like we've been talking every day. <laughs> it's just out of the blue. Some <laughs> I'm bad at being with people, I think. I just, mm. what is that sort of like time blind uh, object permanence problem where you're just like, we haven't spoken in a year, but we're best friends and I will message <laughs> you randomly. Yeah, yeah. 
I've got a few. I've got a few of those. Yep. Um, oh, man. So we talked a lot about your book the, the last time you were on the show. So I don't want to dig too deep into like the necromancy stuff and nah, the soul, with, the soul stuff it. and all of that. Because we talked about it. <laughs> we um, beaten the horse. So I made speak. note here. That was <laughs> beating the horse. That was episode 74, everyone. Uh, so go back and listen to that. We really did get into a lot of the details of your approach to necromancy and your problem with the word ghosts. And if people don't know what I'm talking about, it's episode 74. <laughs> I will, before you ask me whatever well-planned question you have in front of you, though, I want to, I'm going to flip it around. I'm okay. I want to interview you for a second. Tell you me, did this to me last time. I know. Tell me, <laughs> <laughs> all about your very recent exciting news with the troth. I'm so proud and with, excited. Oh, for with you. the troth? Yeah. yeah. Troth. Pronounce it right. <laughs> oh, no, it's like it's like a pig trough. You go. No. <laughs> it is now that you're in charge. So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> oh, that's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on no <laughs> my next guest will be morgan daimler no <laughs> oh my god um i am not in charge of the pig drop <laughs> no i had two very uh big accomplishments recently they were goals i've been working towards for several years now uh one of which was um the one I've been working at the longest was I won the election and I am now the new high steward of the troth. So I mean, so I'm in charge of this global steward program, our ambassadors, the first contact people, the people who build the bridges are public faces of inclusive heathenry. So yeah. And I've already been cracking the whip. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. I, I'm very proud of you and I, I can't think Thank of you. anyone better for the, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And as I told the stewards at our first meeting at our recently at Troth Moot, it's our annual gathering for all the members of the Troth. And you do not have to be a member to join. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> um, I told them, you know, I think usually what most of the things that stewards get, because I've been a steward. First, I was the steward of Illinois for several years, and then I was the Midwest steward. And I, we rebuilt the steward program, me and Patty LaFail and some other folks that helped out a lot. And we turned it into what it is today. And one of the most common work things that a steward will do in their work is just monitor their email account. Yeah. And I tell them, you know, most of the time that email is going to be, I'm interested in heathenry and I don't know what it is. Or I'm a heathen and I'm looking for other people I'm new and I can't find anyone. Can you help? My suspicion is that someone goes to Google and types in heathen or Ossetru or Odin or something, you know, mm -hmm. and they get all the links to all the organizations at some point on that first page or two of results and they email everyone. I want to be the first responder. I want our stewards to be the first responder because I just think it is, I think some of those organizations out there that, that, run that folkish line that racist ideology that it's a quote unquote they call it indigenous northern european i've never heard any phrase so stupid come out of an american mouth <laughs> and, um, anyway they're out there and, and they're very clever about what they do they don't present it that way at first I've seen their websites i see their material i've talked to people that they've talked to i've talked to people who've gotten out of it and they'll all say at first they're all like yeah it's it's our ancestral way and our ancestors and you know like this is great and this is for us and it makes you feel part of something and all of that has some truth to it and all of it is very insidious and nasty and masking that they're going to say now go take this ancestry.com dna test and better not be one drop you know <laughs> that it, that that's there's i won't name them but there are groups out there that do shit like that or they'll yeah. say you know women have their place or you can't be of the lgbtq plus community or you can't be trained you know, like it goes on and on and on 
you know, I think it's a lot like that in the gardening community where you see, and, and I shouldn't pick on us. I mean, it just, <laughs> just Wicca generally, I think, has a real binary bent in some people's eyes. And, uh, and that's not how they present it. Everyone looks like an ally and it's very all acts of love and pleasure are my rituals until you get in there. And then it's suddenly, what were you when you were born? And we want to, you have to mm. do that in circle and it, it gets ugly. And I, I'm like you, I want to be that first responder when people are thinking of inclusive craft where, where they at least get to hear my loud mouth complaining about how <laughs> everyone belongs before they go find where they feel like they fit. And it's, right. it's tough work, but it's important. We got, we got to do it. I agree. I think it's an important thing to do and um, to provide real resources with academic background and real scholarship behind it mm -hmm. and show this beautiful diversity that exists in the lore itself. So <clears throat> anyway, that that's kind of like my drum. I'm always beating about being a steward. And uh, I also, this isn't something I worked on for years necessarily. It was something that I felt was necessary it's like i answered some sort of call that i didn't have a long time ago it's a role i've kind of filled in a lot of ways locally but as years have gone by i have noticed more and more um what they call interfaith work mm -hmm. amongst pagan leadership and heathen leadership and so on and i'm fine with that go ahead and do if you can build a better bridge with different groups and organizations please by all means do so but I don't see enough effort personally of serving our own heathens and our own pagans by leadership. I think there's too much focus on things that look to my mind a little easier. Um, people don't like it when I say that. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> and a lot of people do. So I put myself in the Troth clergy program and that's not the easiest thing to get into to begin with. You have to be a member for a year. You have to complete the heathen essentials course that we have. You have to complete so many modules in the Troth lore program. And that's pretty rigorous. And then once you get through that, you have to apply and be accepted with letters of recommendation and so on to get into the clergy program. And then it has a whole study program. Uh, I spent about a year and a half working on the clergy program. And just this past Troth Moot, I was ordained as clergy. I completed all the tests and passed all the exams, and they liked what I did. <laughs> and it was pretty cool. I tell you, my favorite part of that ritual, it was me and two other guys who had gone through the program, and real good dudes, Tim Adams and Kurt Homan. And Diana Paxson is running the ritual, and there's a part where all the people are gathered in this hall that we were using outside of uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania. I think it was called Deer Park. Um, real cool campgrounds. Anyway, there's a part where Diana asks everyone who's gathered to close their eyes and send your blessings and whatnot to the people who are seeking ordination. And then she mentions, she says, but ask your allies, your powers, your deities, your ancestors, and so on, to lend their blessings to these individuals. And that room was so electric and the air was so thick, you know, like it, that was June 18th. It's July 27th. I'm still kind of riding that high, you know? That's awesome. I, when I saw <clears throat> the pictures you posted, I was so excited. I was like, <laughs> and my kids were like, what mommy? And I was like, my friend did something really cool. And I was trying to explain <laughs> and I showed them the picture. And one of them was like, does that mean? Uh, Lonnie is God's assistant. <laughs> yes. Yes. New stenography. They take dictation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Strike from the, the record. Oh, sorry. <laughs> funny take on clergy. <laughs> yeah, that, that is one thing I think those of us who are in those sorts of roles in paganism, heathen, witchcraft, whatever, you know, like we have to sort of borrow words from the wider culture to describe what it is we are and what we do. We do. And I, I uh, I've started using a term. It's never, it's like fetch from the mean girls movies, never going to catch on, but I have started, <laughs> I've started using the term speaker. Uh, yeah. 
to describe leaders in the gardening tradition because we traditionally have a lot of terms from peerage lady for example would be like a third degree cutting leader and so on but yeah it's more of that gendered stuff there's not a masculine version there's not a non-gendered version but the way i describe it is that a speaker speaks not just for their coven but for the gods we have to be that intermediary for our people internally and externally but also for the deity to them and and in reverse so I think speaker is a really good description of how I imagine being a gardener and coven leader. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe it will catch on. We'll see. Yeah, it might. You know, um, I did see on your website. I don't know if I've ever noticed this before. I was just going through your website, looking at different things you've been up to, maybe that I hadn't caught on to. And um, scrolled all the way down to the bottom because I was looking for something else. And then I saw a thing that said seekers. So I yeah. clicked on it. <laughs> And uh, I see that, um, I mean, I was going to bring this up later, but we're already on covens and stuff, so why not? Um, I saw that you now, maybe you always have, I don't know, you offer online and distance training through your coven. And I thought that was really interesting. How's that work? So uh, just to start, I used to keep a separate uh, website for my coven and kept those lives kind of separate, but it started to seem silly after a point, so I sort of snuck it in under the radar (laughs) (laughs) under the footer there um yeah during the pandemic really early on you know i i take a real strong stance about safety and i think being on the mortuary side of things we could see how dangerous things were getting and i was the first coven to my knowledge to announce that we were suspending in-person meetings for safety purposes back in 2020 and i caught a lot of flack for that and Someone told me it was very privileged of me to close meetings. And I'm still scratching. What? I'm still scratching my head about that. Um, <laughs> so we did that and my coven and I talked about it. We started meeting by Zoom and that kind of thing. And it was working out for us. And I was like, you know, at the same time, we're kind of dealing with this rise of sort of anti-trans sentiment within the, the community and that kind of stuff. And I was like, you know what? If this is working for us, it can work for other people. And this will allow us to sort of expand our reach outward and include people who aren't able to find a coven home for the dumbest dumb shit reasons anybody ever heard of. (laughs) So so let's give it a try. And uh, just sort of quietly opened that up. And now, three years later, we have a fully electronic curriculum it's super rigorous it's treated like academia it's a it's not unlike a community college degree where you log in and you have modules and classwork and stuff to do and then we meet twice a month via zoom and then our local people we meet once a month in person and um, people who need to travel for you know initiations elevations that kind of stuff we can plan ahead and make it as affordable as possible to get folks here and it's a whole bunch of work I do for sort of thankless. <laughs> you know, that's that's being a uh, leadership in any religious group, I think, or any faith group. Sure. Yeah. I hope that when we finish our sort of first class, so to speak, of, of folks and get to the other side, that it'll be something that I can say to other coven leaders, like, here's kind of what we did and take that. And That would you... be very cool. Yeah. But... <clears throat> We found ourselves able to take on students that we never would have met before. And uh, I say we as if I'm not one fucking person doing that. <laughs> you know, the, the group of people as a whole. Like, I might be sure. a challenge, but we're doing this together, right? But uh, mostly it's a bunch of just, you know, silly queer nerds that you know, <laughs> were getting rejected from seeking for the virtue of their their race or gender or sexual identity and you know i'm just gonna initiate a bunch of shit kicking weirdos so they can go off and <laughs> we'll just make gardener and wicca be something different <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic you don't ruin it for everybody <laughs> uh, that's that's kind of one of our missions not stated i guess directly <laughs> in the troth is we, we just keep opening the door to every weirdo out there come on in come because on. we are weird as fuck too <laughs> You know? <laughs> I was, I'm telling you before we started, I think that, uh, I think Gardnerian Wicca, traditional Wicca, if you're doing it right, is much more like uh, a Norse heathen kindred than, yeah. than most people would imagine, I think. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were talking about that. And I said, if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> now, we are. Here we are. Earl, early on in the formation of American heathenry, they didn't have a lot of examples on how to build anything, right? Yes. So you get, you get some less than desirable people creating rituals that it stuck around uh, so stop me if this sounds familiar it's not <laughs> something i do and it's not something that a lot i think i think there are probably still a lot of heathens out there to do it but anyway stop me if this sounds familiar <laughs> hammer of the north warden and protect this holy <laughs> set I know, I've heard it. <laughs> hammer of the west <laughs> the funny thing about that is, so. is that so everybody listening probably knows the amazing Leah Svensson who wrote the Loki and Sijin book that I did the forward for. Never heard of him. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no Leah's awesome. And, Leah is awesome. And Leah's been in the Coven of Leaves for a good long time. And we were constantly comparing notes because as they sort of figured out that we're not doing what they expected, I was sort of figuring out that they weren't doing what I was expecting and Mm -hmm. what you're describing that you know calling the powers and elements and stuff sure. that's not yeah. really a feature of what we're doing either because that's some stuff from like 90s silver raven wolf and whatever right, right. yeah that's nothing to do with us at all so <laughs> we mutually have that misunderstanding living between us mm -hmm. <laughs> right yeah that, that like from a heathen perspective anyway um it is getting less and less i get it's less and less borrowing from yeah. other traditions yeah. as research into history and things and reimagining how that might work is getting better. Yes. You know, we know like pre-conversion times in certain places, there was a tradition of walking a flame around a place to make it sacred in a way. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have that. We know there was a tradition of honoring land spirits. I mean, there's the whole Icelandic sagas, you know, where they, there's one part where they're talking about you have to take the dragon's head off the long ship so you don't scare the fucking land spirits. Um, and they, they name the specific land spirits of Iceland. And, and, you know, so boil that down to your local practice and you're obviously honoring land spirits and things as part of your practice. So you get, you get little bits like that from what survives and you create something meaningful that has, it, it, it's not the same, but it's in that, it's in that river. It's in that flow, right? Of course, if if anybody's doing their, I can't talk about things that are both bound gardener and Wicca sure tradition, but yeah, anybody doing their homework about early founders like Dorian Valiant, Gerald Gardner, and stuff. I mean, you can sort of see the roots of what they were doing, looking at things like Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism, OTO, and that kind of stuff. Right. But I think today you see more Gardnerian sort of looking at that sort of critically and going, okay, let's take all that crap out and sort of look at what's really, what we are without that. And uh, you see more of a movement toward this kind of conscious difference where people are sort of creating these very unique images of what the tradition is within their individual covens because they're making it very personalized to themselves. Um, and I'm probably going to get a bunch of hate mail from traditional Wiccans who are like, what the hell are you talking about? That's not what <laughs> you ask a hundred gardenarians, you get a hundred different answers and I can't get 10 of them in my living room to decide on a kind of pizza. So, <laughs> which is interesting considering you all have lineages. <laughs> we do. But yeah think right now of a relative that you have that you hate and and that <laughs> that's having a lineage in traditional witchcraft I and mean, it's going to be sure. yeah it's going to be a bunch of like racist homophobic old people that you mm -hmm. wish you didn't have to be related to <laughs> <laughs> we don't invite them to thanksgiving that's oh absolutely <laughs> i mean i think of it i think one of the best examples from my own life to compare the like the lineage thing to I used to train in a system called Ed Parker's American Kenpo Karate. I'm familiar, yes. And, and Grandmaster Ed Parker created this whole system, and then he taught people, and he raised them up to black belts, and he sent them out into the world to teach his system, and they quickly started changing things <laughs> <laughs> until you have all these different lineages that 
will tell you kind of what you're getting into and how it's different from the other one. And then there's the guys out there like I teach the original Parker system. And then there's another guy's like, no, you don't. And <laughs> like in Garnarians, you have the traditional Wiccans and you have the really traditional Wiccans and you have the traditional, traditional, like traditional paired <laughs> kind of Wiccans. Or but I think when you're talking about something that you pass down person to person, like, like our martial arts here, it's, does start to fall apart at the edges a little bit and oh my god i'm gonna get so much hate now y'all i'm not ruining gardenary books <laughs> <laughs> but like if you were following things the way we're expected to within heathenry you would still be passing down you know hammers in the north or whatever because it was given to you and you must teach it to the next person yeah now it's not a bad ritual a i bad. joke about it because yeah. of what it's associated to and who created it and fuck that guy but anyway you know um i think it does work because i i have been part of well when i was in the rune guild for instance mm -hmm. um that is a ritual that you're taught in the rune guild as a means of tradition that is expected to be taught to your student and so on and so on exactly Pass right it on. Pass it on. yeah so i'm curious what do you and leah argue about or discuss that is so similar that you two see oh gosh i think i would need leah in the same conversation for that to really work but well, you know, send a message to leah and get them in here <laughs> <laughs> you know one of the things that we talked about probably more than anything is that idea that you know kindred and covens aren't that different no 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 no. You're, and all of it comes from like a lodge idea anyway i think right you're a group of people doing yeah. thing together that you care about i mean we i think more so than people don't have opinions about kindreds right you don't hear that phrase very much like in the public consciousness oh you know? in the public consciousness no but right. among heathens you say kindred we all know exactly what you mean right but people aren't like making up weird horror movie things about it right but um. I but covens, so. if you, they are, email me. No. <laughs> you hear the word coven, and you think of a dozen ridiculous things you saw in the WB or something, right? Like, no, I thought that's all real. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I put on my black robe with my big hood and my Flava Flav sized pentagram, and just Fuck, yes. like, roll up in there. No, and, and I think that uh, I think Leo was probably surprised <laughs> to find that we were just, you know, probably sitting around drinking, telling stories about our ancestors. <laughs> 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 yeah i mean we do a lot of that too um yeah there's some of that i would think you if when you drill down that's where you get more of the differences yeah. in like I, and but i wonder too though because i don't know so in heathenry amongst many heathens i can't speak for everyone you will find the entire spectrum of a belief between from animus to atheist and Same. everything in between but you will find a very common thread with all of us where we don't we don't necessarily believe in the gods we don't believe in the spirits we don't believe in the ancestors we relate to the world as if they're just there we just know, it's just like you know the police are out there and they have speed traps and you drive accordingly whether you have ticket money or not but you behave as if you know they're out there. And that is like a core thing that seems to be, it's not a hundred percent, but it's very consistent with heathenry and it's consistent with research and back into the Viking age too. In Gardnerian craft, you see everything across the board. I can't speak for everybody. I can speak for myself and <laughs> barely my little group of misfits. Like, and we're all across the board from atheists to agnostics to, mm -hmm. you know, woo woo nut jobs like myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think any of us believe in gods. And there is something I tell my students very often, and I'll tell it to you and your listeners now. Most witches don't believe in gods. They know the gods exist, of course. They even deal with them occasionally. But they don't <laughs> believe in them. They know them too well. It would be like believing in the postman. So it's for Terry Pratchett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is one of the best things that Terry ever said in his books. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, 
it, it, it is. It's like that. I used to have these discussions with like Evo Dominguez and I have been had discussions about the difference between being devotional and seeking magical practices. And I've always said I'm not devotional at all. That is just not my bag. Uh, I do seek the magic in things and stuff, but we never got outside of that box of devotional and magical. No, I'm not devotional because I'm re- I'm building relationships. I'm not I'm not kneeling. I'm not worshiping. I'm not I'm not going that direction necessarily. I feel like my relationship <clears throat> is like my relationship with my five year olds, where like the five year old, <laughs> please just eat one more bite of your dinner. I will give you a popsicle. And then I'm over here with the Morgan, like if you would please just help me out with this, I will help you that cool knife we saw. <laughs> They are toddlers. Oh my god! <laughs> Look, Oya, I sent you another pinwheel, but you gotta cool it with this thunderstorm, okay? <laughs> I'm over here like, <laughs> if you help me with this one thing, I will tell everyone your name. <laughs> You'd be tell. the coolest kid in the park. I tell everyone at school how cool you are. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and if you don't, you're off the altar. Time out. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> we have just fucked up your religions. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I'm going to go in the house and I'm going to get this guy from every altar. In the- <laughs> I just keep looking this way because that's where mine is. I don't know that that crow just turned its head. I just know it did. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Well, well yeah, I, I am glad you brought that up because I think it's important that that we all realize John Beckett used to talk about his idea of this big tent of paganism, right? Cause he wanted everybody. And, but then I think he sort of gave up on it. Honestly, I haven't seen him talk about it in a while, uh, but I recognize it because like we have a pretty sizable ADF Grove in Champaign, Illinois, that's nearby where I live. And the rituals are public. Everyone's welcome. There's, there's a lot of heathens there course uh, there's celtic druid type practitioners there's I- specific irish pagan type practitioners there's your general kind of eclectic witches all mingling coming together because they crave that community they crave that connection to someone who's just enough like them that they don't feel like they're being othered right and yeah, I just I, I want us all to see the similarities among each other more than we see those differences. The differences only matter when you're in your own ritual space, right? Then doing yeah. your thing. <clears throat> and you know, not even then really. Truly. Hot take. But right. It, it's not that it matters necessarily. It's just that's where the differences are. And exactly. it's not that big a deal. You should be connecting to others. Exactly. And I I I talk about games a lot because I think play is a big part of magic. I think play is a big part of life. It's how human beings learn. We first learn life skills by playing as children, right? And of course, I'm a big gamer nerd and anybody that knows me knows that the bones fall in the spiral is actually the name name of the holy text of Phrasma, which is a fictional deity in Galarian, which is the world of Paizo's Pathfinder RPG. And I got their specific permission to use that name because I wanted to show people that it's okay to honor playing. And um, I talk about how games can be really good for team building and how they can be really hugely impactful on your magical practice. And anyone listening, please email me and ask me to run another session of my RPG and magic class because people never know what I'm talking about when I run it. And I would just would love to see some folks in there, but when we get away from pagan and pagans and we flip the script over to gamers so maybe you love playing Catan, and maybe i love playing magic the gathering and maybe my friend over here really loves playing dungeons and dragons because they have no taste or whatever but <laughs> i find her is better <laughs> at least they're not sending the pinkertons after you 
<laughs> Who's that for? Someone listening to this. But um, those people still fit tidily under the roof of the same game convention, right? You're not playing mm-hmm. the same games. I don't know the rules of Catan, but I've got some friends who play it, and we can still talk about how we're passionate about games. We can talk about yeah. how much we love getting people together under the table, and they'll try and convince me to show up for a game of Catan, and I'll try and convince them to come play Pathfinder with me, and we'll never do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that if pagans could stop taking the space so fucking seriously and stop mm-hmm. looking at shared space like we have to communicate in these really meaningful mystical ways and look at it like a bunch of nerds hanging out under the same roof because they like the same nerd stuff i think we'd be a lot happier i think so too i think so too my grove the adf grove i'm part of prairie sky grove in champaign urbana so it's online look it up folks if you want to get involved with it at all if you're in the area um we're a very strange group of weird people (laughs) and we're fun and uh yeah same same for the covid of (laughs) Find them on my website, Rip them. Hide yeah. them on Twitter down there. <laughs> and I haven't put a website up for the kindred that I've been building. I'm, I'm trying to build a wall of inclusive heathenry across East Central Illinois. I've got some early on volunteers. It's going very well so far. It's the Crow Kindred. As soon as that has a website, it'll be out there someday. We're going to do like Raven Kindred North did back in the day, is my plan, is to provide resources to people who want to find how to heathen but it's going to be a very obvious inclusive source so that's a big mission thanks um i do have listener questions (laughs) i do yes um we got way one (laughs) yeah one listener question is from a longtime patreon (laughs) member named amy um amy said what is it like working with the dead every day being a mortician and did it change your perspective of death oh gosh i think i went into it with a scary perspective of death and and anyone that's listened to me talk before knows that and if you haven't listened to me talk before go deep dive my like spotify list of interviews i won't won't bore you with stuff i said before but um I don't know. I think it made it more mundane for me in a lot of ways, at least digging into the more like scientific, practical, hands-on elements, because I've been working with the dead magically forever, as long as I can remember. But um, I don't know. You reach a point where it's very sort of, it feels more like a parent taking care of a little kid than it does some spooky person with blood all over the place or whatever, like you see in a movie. Um you know you're gonna have to go in there and give them a bath and brush their hair and lift their legs up and wipe their ass and what all the stuff <laughs> you have to do all the things right and it really does start to for anyone who's parented or taking care of little kids at any point or an elderly relative you know what that stuff's like and you wind up having this sort of almost mundane caretaker relationship with the dead which i think is really precious in a lot of ways, but it it gets funny after a while because you become so comfortable that it's alienating to to other people. (laughs) 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 What are you doing? What are you talking about? You're in there playing the radio and stuff. Uh, Anytime I'm in a prep room with the deceased, it's like, what year were you born? And I like to look and see what year they turned 16. I, that's my window. Like when people are 16 or 17, they're like forging a lot of their identity. So I find out what music was popular the year they were 16 and 17, and I would play that on my iPod while I do my work. That is such a fucking awesome idea. Wow. What a fucking awesome idea. I love that. So I'm in there bopping around to whatever they probably liked when they were young, and that's that's fun and weird, and people will be walking in, and it's like, oh, so we're listening to, to The Temptations today. Oh, it's <laughs> Glenn Miller this afternoon, or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's it's that kind of stuff that really makes it for me that's cool yeah i like that thank you um there's another listener question but i have one in between i wanted to throw in before we got to it because i think it helps uh da, 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 da. i found on your blog you say you don't wear shoes in a cemetery unless you must why <laughs> so i can't i mean i can tell you why for me but i can't really explain the origin so my grandmother would never wear shoes in cemetery. She never really explained it to me, but 
she seemed to be of the opinion that it was rude that you don't wear shoes and someone else <laughs> like you take off your shoes at the door and it's like if they can't give you permission you should assume they don't want you to ruin the rug <laughs> 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 and I picked it up from her and I started doing it as an adult. And then at a, at a turning point that was particularly important for me when I was sort of dedicating my life to some tasks for deities, particularly funerary work oriented stuff, um, I swore a geish um, to the Morrigan and to Anubis that that would be one of my oaths to them, that unless I must either A, for my own safety, or B, as a requirement of a job-oriented task I was doing, I would never wear shoes in a cemetery, or, or known burial place, even if it's not specifically a cemetery. Sometimes, <laughs> like, like if I was acting as a funeral director or, or uh, performing a service, I might be required to wear shoes, but <laughs> aside from that. So you must. Yeah. I must, yeah. Yeah, you are a perfect example of what I teach my students to not do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, do not make oaths to gods. <laughs> so for anyone who's unfamiliar, a geisha is a specific kind of oath. Are you yeah, familiar? a real prickly kind. They're, they're like prickly. boogers that dry up on your skin. You don't know they're there, but then you know they're there. They don't come off. <laughs> A geisha is kind of like a self-inflicted curse, sort of. Yeah. You receive large gifts in return, um, or small ones if that's what you wanted. Uh, but if you break your geish or if it conflicts with another one, you could be in a real pickle. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you see some things like that play out in the Morrigan story, like um, having the, the hero warrior swear that he would never turn down food offered to him by an elder and also swearing that he would never consume the flesh of dogs. So when she in the form of an elderly woman offers him dog flesh, he's forced to break his gauge either way. So, and so he lost his heroic strength and died. <laughs> <laughs> Toddlers. <laughs> Toddlers. <laughs> but I think in the context of that story, it's really sweet, though, because he was tired, he was done, and that was her way of saying, you know, I'm here to receive that death. I'm, mm. I know you're done, so I'm going to give you a way out. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yes, I'm a terrible example. Don't do that shit that I've done. Right. <laughs> yeah, I stand my ground. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> of my own. Um, one of my oaths to the Morrigan is that unless I am in my house, in it specifically, <laughs> I must have some type of bladed item on my person at all points in time. Try and figure that out when you have to like go to court for a traffic ticket or get on an airplane. Mm. I have come up with all kinds of wacky shit to get around that. Like I. I blacksmith to the tiniest little knife you've ever seen to wear on planes. <laughs> it's, it's like a tiny little pendant and it's like, please don't argue with me today, TSA man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be tricky. Wow. Why? I don't want to know why. I'm sure it's private anyway, so it's fine. It is. Yes. Um, a listener question it was sent to me privately. I wanted to I wanted to include this in here because it, it flows along that thought. They wanted to know if um, should we be working magically or spiritually in any way with potter's fields? Oh, tricky stuff. I think there's a lot of meaningful work to do there, but I think you need to be really, really thoughtful about it. Mm -hmm. Some of the space, I mean, all of the potter's fields you're going to see, and then they're filled with people who really got the worst shake in life. You're going to see impoverished people, the enslaved, people who were killed for religious beliefs, gender identity, so on and so on. I think that doing cleanup, volunteer work, helping fundraise for their upkeep, these are great ways to magically interact with those kinds of spaces. Mm-hmm. But I don't recommend going in there and making them sort of ritual working spaces because mm -hmm. it's, it's not your space. You know, let those folks be, you know? Yeah. 
I'll agree with that. There's a pretty large Potterfield section in our like big local city cemetery, mm-hmm. and it's got a vibe. It's it's got kind of an angry vibe. So anything I've done with it is always, you know, you and I have talked about how <laughs> I approach the concept of an onku and how I make offerings every Samhain because I think it's an office that changes, you know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I've really it's supposed to be. I've done offerings and work every every once in a while. It's usually around the um, the autumn equinox. I have this whole thing that I do where I consecrate apples. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a whole Iduna kind of related rite. And then I take them. It's a whole day long event because I've got ancestry buried in cemeteries in different counties all around me. I go visit the ones that I know where they are. And then friends, I do friends first, family second. <laughs> uh, but I go and visit their graves and I leave that apple on the grave and I have a specific thing I do when I get there and I turn and walk away. Now, if I were to look over my shoulder, a squirrel's probably got it before I get back to my car. But that is something that I do at that potter's grave on that same that same ritual cycle is I will leave apples there too as a signification of peace and empowerment and lift you up into a higher state and bring healing make you hail and whole and so on the area that i live in has one potter's field that was particularly used for enslaved individuals and it's completely forgotten it's grown up with trees and um, something that i've done is go out there and start manually cleaning it for the last couple of years, I've been going out there whenever I can just to clear stuff out. And uh, I've done a little bit of research about um, living descendants of some of the individuals buried there. And unfortunately, information is sparse in, in many of these cases. But what I've tried to do is sort of anonymously make donations to individuals or, or charitable organizations that might make sense and groups that would help do the cleanup there, which... I know it stays on the mundane side of things, but I think in a lot of times that's, in a lot of instances, that's good magic, you know? I -hmm. think, I think whatever you can do to act in a way that it helps there be remembrance for those folks and takes care of of people that are still alive, I think is, is good work. I agree. Well, I think we have, pretty much come towards the end of the regular portion. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I did not bring up? <clears throat> oh gosh, you know, I'm bad at this sort of thing. <laughs> I just tell people to, you know, holler at me online if they want to find me. And uh, something I did not have last time we spoke is I, I finally broke down much to my shame and regret. <laughs> I now have a Patreon, but it's actually, I know. It's kind of been fun, though. I I saw you getting there today. Thank you. I joined it today, so I support your Patreon. (laughs) I support yours. We can just hand five dollars. That's right. We just swap five bucks. (laughs) Back and forth. uh, Yeah. So that's new, and I I like it more than I thought I would. I I said for years I would never do it. I don't like there being a a paywall between me and folks. And my my lowest tier is a dollar, and I have a note that if. If someone can't afford it, if they sign up for it, I will give them back the dollar every month, whatever right. whatever I can yeah. do to make it accessible. But um, it has been nice to get my blog away from, you know, AI scrapers and <laughs> all that stuff. So, yeah, it's fun. Oh, good. Yeah, and it is pretty cool. Like I said, I, I seriously did. I just joined it today. I didn't know you had a Patreon. <laughs> Until I clicked on one of your blog posts on your website and it said you were moving everything away from the AI thing. So um, off I went to join it. And don't think of it as a paywall. It is not a paywall. It is a means for the people who love what you do to say thank you. I have I've just gotten a pop-up. It's a text message from Matt Oren saying someone asked if I was problematic, whether they should have me on their podcast and Matt says they told him I was very problematic and to block me immediately, probably. Matt just sent that to you now? Yeah, just now. <laughs> Tell Matt you're busy with me and to leave you alone. <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> I love 
Johnny Scott to tell mm-hmm. you I'm busy. Okay. <laughs> this is so <laughs> exciting for your listeners. <laughs> Matt has to appear on every episode I do somehow. Somehow, yes. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, somehow. <laughs> That's too funny. Matt's so All right. funny. We we text back and forth about dinosaur chicken nuggets. <laughs> it's fine. Matt is one of my absolute favorite human beings out there, so it's fine. <laughs> he says, is he interviewing you right now? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am, Matt. <laughs> well, now as you he- listen back to this show and we're yelling at you <laughs> um, he said tell him and everyone else I said hi I love that guy <laughs> <laughs> we love you too brother thank you <laughs> oh alright okay well special guest star network <laughs> patreon.com slash what mortellus mortellus yes all right go go join folks uh that wraps up the regular portion the rest of this is going to go over to patreon my patreon but first mortellus thank you so much for coming back as always this was awesome it, it's always a pleasure even if we get off into left field i, I hope folks enjoy talking <laughs> left field is where the best conversations are usually it's true it's very true <clears throat> all right um <laughs> if you want to hear the rest of this conversation uh mortellus and i are going to go talk about mediumship and we're going to do it on the patreon side so go to patreon.com slash weird web radio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click to join the membership stay weird out there my friends and now it is back to bonus audio time mortellus you look distracted are you ready <laughs> i am i was trying to see what what Matt said to me. <laughs> Matt or right. remaining the special guest star of this episode. <laughs> yeah. Does Matt want to come on to the Patreon part? <laughs> we'll, I'll relay messages back and forth like a translator. Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions, magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weirdwebradio you can find me on facebook as weirdwebradio or come join the new fun and exciting weirdwebradio facebook group thank you again for being here stay weird out there my friends (laughs) 